to everybody back, and uh, like I've said so often, you know, on this television program, we take a coffee break after every half hour, and uh, we're always glad that everybody gets it back in here before we end the afternoon. So anyway, we're glad you're all here, and for those of you joining us on television, if you're ever through Tulsa on a first Wednesday of the month, stop in and enjoy an afternoon of these tapings. We, uh, we always appreciate people stopping in. All right. I guess we can just go right back to where we left off, and uh, that's in Hebrews chapter 7. And uh, we've been talking about Melchizedek, in case you're a new listener, the, uh, the priest of the Most High God, which was the reference of God concerning the non-Jewish world. And uh, I think just to pick up the flow, we'll start with verse 11. Uh, Jerry's already got it up here, and I guess I want to remind everybody that if this program is in book 50. So uh, if you desire a tape or anything concerning this program, just mention that you're looking for pro, uh, book number 50. All right, so verse 11 of Hebrews 7, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, in other words, if the law and Judaism was all that there was to be gained, for under it the people received the law. Well, if that's the case, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not after the order of Aaron? In other words, the Aaronic priesthood was that which began in Exodus, the brother of Moses, and carried all the way through to the time of Christ. And uh, even though the veil was rent in twain, the Jewish people, of course, sewed it back up, at least according to legend. And they continued on with their temple worship until Titus destroyed it in 70 A.D. But we as believers understand that when Christ finished the work of the cross, He also finished the demands of the law because He was the fulfillment of the law. And when we enter into this salvation by grace, we are no longer under the demands of the Mosaic system. But now our high priest, our high priest is not of the line of Aaron, but the one of Melchizedek, who, as I said in an earlier program, I feel was Christ himself. All right, so now then, verse 12, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. In other words, you couldn't just change part of it. It had to all go. And this is the whole idea, of course, of Hebrews, is that the Jewish people had to realize that the Mosaic system had now become moot. It was no longer necessary to practice temple worship and sacrifices and tithing and all those things that were demanded by the law because we now are under a priesthood that was not out of Aaron or Levi, but from the priesthood of Melchizedek. Now let's move on. Verse 13, For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. Now that should shake people up. This priest didn't even come from the Levitical priestly tribe. This priest came from the kingly tribe of Judah. And Judah, of course, was the tribe that was always leading the tribes when they moved. And it was out of Judah, of course, that uh, David, uh, did David came? Yeah, David came out of the line of Judah. Saul, of course, from the line of Benjamin, but Judah was the designated tribe to, per, to uh, produce the kings of Israel. And so it's out of this kingly tribe that this priest comes, which, of course, is Jesus Christ. All right? Verse 13 again. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the elder. Now, you remember a few weeks ago, <clears throat> I took you back to the Old Testament where the Israelite Korah 
who thought that Moses and Aaron were just a little bit too big for their own britches, and Korah said, after all, why can't I present an, a sacrifice at the altar? You remember that? And, of course, Moses got highly exercised, and he says, all right. All right, we'll put you to the test. If you think you have a right to exercise the role of a priest, we'll do such and such. And we remember, we read all the verses. And God was so angry that the earth opened up and the families of Korah went down into the pit. Well, what did it show us? Just that, that no one dared enter into the priesthood except the line of Levi. Now we saw another one with King Saul in our last taping. Whoa, what was Saul's big downfall? He too exercised the right of a priest and offered a sacrifice. And Samuel told him, Saul, how can you be so foolish? You don't do that. Well, here it is again. No man, unless they were from the lineage of Levi, could possibly exercise the role of a priest. It was Forbidden. All right, now then. Verse 14, But it is evident that our Lord, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, the Son, as we see Him epitomized here in Hebrews, He sprang out of Judah, the kingly tribe, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning a priesthood. Now then, verse 15, it is even far more evident. For that after the similitude or the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest, a totally different priest, not of the Aaronic, not of the tribe of Levi, but out of the tribe of Judah. All right, verse 16. Who is made? Here comes again my, my stand that I feel Melchizedek was a theophany of Christ in the Old Testament. He's only mentioned in Psalms, but now here we have him exemplified as our high priest because of what he accomplished, of course, at the cross. All right. Verse 16. Who is made? not after the law of a carnal or a fleshly commandment. Now that goes back to what we said in the last hour. The law was beggarly. The law was fleshly. Now that's hard for people to comprehend when I say the law was fleshly. They thought the law was spiritual. It was perfect. It was. From God's point of view, but from man's point of view, there was no power given to keep it. So what did it become? Fleshly, carnal. And it was something that man could not deal with. In fact, uh, I know it's in Corinthians, but I hadn't better try. I might not find it fast enough. But Corinthians tells us the same thing, that the law was a minister of death. Oh, I, I, I used that one night in McAllister, and it just shook people up. The law was the minister of death? Yes, because it had no power to help people keep the law. And so the law, I, I can show you one. Let's come back to Romans. My, again, I think it helps us to just keep reviewing, reviewing, and reviewing some more. Back to Romans chapter 3. Back to Romans chapter 3. That gave me time enough to find the one in Corinthians. <laughs> okay, Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Now, these are verses that most people do not understand. They don't even know they're in here. And I've given an example before. I'll never forget one time I was teaching it and uh, had a young pastor in the midst, and when I read this verse, I could just about see his mouth drop open. He had never seen it before. I know he hadn't. But here it is. 
Verse 19 of Romans 3, Now we know that what things soever the law, the Ten Commandments, whatever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that is Israel, that every mouth, the whole world now, not just Israel, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world, not just Israel, the law condemned the whole world. What does the rest of the verse say? that the world may become guilty, not saved, not righteous, guilty. I see most people don't believe that. You know, I'm amazed when people will tell me when they've had an enlightenment and they've seen these things and they go back and show it to their church people and their church people will read it and then you know what they say? But I don't believe it. <laughs> now, isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? They better. They better. It's the Word of God, and they better believe it or they're in trouble. All right, so this they don't like. That the law just simply makes man guilty? Yes. Next verse. Therefore, by the deeds or the keeping of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Why? Because by the law is the knowledge of not life, but what? Sin. That's all the law can do is show man their sin. Not a word in Scripture ever gives the law credit for bringing people to salvation. Never. All the law can do is convince us that we're sinners, which, of course, we have to do before we can be saved. But see, that's the law. And that's why it was imperfect. It was Filled the gap between Moses and Christ, yes. It kept the nation of Israel in a relationship with Jehovah, yes. But so far as really being the answer to mankind's dilemma, no. It was weak. It was beggarly. See? All right, now I told you I found the one in Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's go to verse 3, honey. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, let's start with verse 3. All got it? First, or 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, in other words, their daily life was to be like the Word of God in print, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, as the Spirit energizes you and I in our daily life. Not in tables of stone, such as Moses brought down from the mountain, you know, but in fleshly tables of the heart. In other words, the Word of God should just simply be seen in our daily lives. Now verse 4. Such trust we have through Christ to Godward. Not, verse 5, that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Now verse 6. Here's the verse that shook him up who also, God, hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, this on this side of the cross, not of the letter, which is a reference in Scripture of the law, but of the Spirit. Now let me qualify. Israel understood right from wrong by virtue of what the law said. Is that right? They understood it was wrong to murder because the law said, Thou shalt not let, uh, murder. And all through the Ten Commandments, you have really the whole sphere of human behavior. Everything you can imagine is covered on those Ten Commandments. So there was no doubt as to what God called right and what He called wrong. So when we say we're not under the law, it isn't that we are now free to steal or murder because we've got something better than the written law. 
And what is it? The indwelling Holy Spirit. The Spirit will never tell a believer to go and steal. The Holy Spirit will never tell a believer to gossip. That's against his personality. And so what we lay down when we say we're not under the law, we pick up through the energizing power of the indwelling Spirit. That's why I say that when we're under grace, it's not license, under grace, the Spirit comes in and becomes then the, the driving force and the keeping power for the believer. All right, but finish it. So we're not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Now here it comes. For the letter killeth, that is the law, but the Spirit giveth life. Now then, verse 7. But if the ministration of what? Death. That's what it says. Now, if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stone, well, goodness, what's it talking about? The Ten Commandments. They were ministration of death. People can't understand that. But I hope you do. It's because all the law could do was condemn. It couldn't give anybody life. It was a ministration of death. Because, you see, Paul says so clearly then in Romans 6.36, for the wages of sin is what? Death. The gift of God is eternal life. All right, now finish the verse, verse 7. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stone, was glorious, it was from God's point, it was perfect. So that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory has to be done away. What does that mean? The law has to go. There comes a point in human history where the law is going to have to be set aside. And when was that? When Christ finished the work of the cross. Now, let me show you another verse that says the same thing. On your way back to Hebrews, stop at Colossians. Just stop at Colossians. Chapter 2, verse that we've used quite often over the years. Colossians, chapter 2. Verse 14. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Y'all there? Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was what? For us or against us? Against us. Because it was impossible in the flesh to keep them all. Now, I'm not going to say this dogmatically, but I think I've mentioned often enough on the program that by the time of our New Testament and the time of Christ, the law had been degenerated, watered down, however you want to call it, from Ten Commandments to how many? Yeah, I heard it. 613. 613 rules and regulations made up the Mosaic Law at the time of Christ. 613 of them. Well, could any man keep them? No. And so I think, now I say I think, this is my own view. I'm not saying that this is what the Scripture says. But I think that this handwriting of ordinances that was against the Jewish people were those 613 rules and regulations. And they were contrary to us. And look what Christ did. He took it out of the way and nailed it to his cross. And what does the cross do? Puts it to death. And so when you look at the law, whether you want to look at the Ten Commandments or you want to look at all 613 that the rabbis had put together, I don't care. It was all nailed to his cross. Why? 
because when he finished the death, burial, and resurrection, he satisfied all the demands of those commandments on the human race. And now we've been set free and we're under grace. All right, now let's come back to Hebrews. So under this whole new economy, where we're not under the law, we're under grace, we also have a new high priest. Not of the priesthood of Aaron and Levi, but one who was of the priest of the Most High God. Are you going to hear that in your sleep tonight? The Most High God, who was the God of everybody, not just Israel. And so this high priest is going to represent every tongue and tribe and nation, not just Israel. All right, let's move on. Verse 15, I guess I better reread it. And it is far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal or a fleshly commandment, but after the power of of what kind of a life? Endless. He's eternal. He comes out of eternity past and he'll go on into eternity future without end, without beginning. And then verse 17, for he testified, coming out of Psalms now, 110, for he testified, thou art a priest for Ever. That's never going to end. Now, goodness sakes, I don't have to tell you. How long did the priesthood last of the priests of Israel? Till they what? Died. Till they died. <laughs> that ended it. Death ends everything. In the same way with the priesthood. When the priest died, his priesthood went with him. It ended. But this priest, it will never end. He ever liveth and intercedes for us. All right? Verse 18. For there is verily a disannulling or a canceling out of the commandment going before for the weakness and profitableness thereof. Are you getting the point? Oh, the law had its purpose. It was perfect from God's vantage point but it was weak and fleshly so far as men were concerned, and so it fades off. It failed miserably. My, if you doubt that, have you read your Old Testament lately? Just go back and read Judges. Go back and read the Prophets. How much effect did the law have on the behavior of the Israelites? You're scared to answer, aren't you? Not much. They were the pits, most of them. Now that may fly in the face of some of my Jewish listeners, and I know I've got quite a few, but all you have to do is read the account, and the most visible one, or the most understandable one, is when Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal up there on Mount Carmel. And after he had run from the threats of Jezebel, you remember, he goes all the way down to the Negev and sits down under a juniper tree, and poor Elijah said, Lord, take my life. What? I'm the only one left. They've all followed Baal. Now listen, who was the promoter of Baal worship at that time in Israel? What woman? Jezebel. So what does that tell you? They were living in rank immorality. And Elijah thought he was the only one that wasn't. Now that tells you enough. But God was merciful enough to say, no, Elijah, you're not quite. How many were still true to the God of Israel? 7,000. Now, 7,000 out of an average population of 7 million over Israel's history, I've said this over and over, what percentage is that? One-tenth of one percent that had remained true to Jehovah. The rest had all followed in the worship of Baal. 
Now I know Jewish people probably try to tell me, well, they're still all going to be saved because they were under the covenant promises, but I don't think so. But that just goes to show you that the law, the mosaic system, didn't work. My, come up to Christ's earthly ministry. Come up to his earthly ministry. How many of the Jews at Christ's time were true, exemplary believers? Very few. Very few. Oh, they were religious. They kept temple worship. They kept the feast days. But very few were true believers. And so the law of Moses just didn't affect the nation that much. Well, then, of course, we come into our own day and hasn't changed, has it? Even the gospel of grace has not made that much difference in the world's behavior. Well, got a couple minutes left. Let's take another verse or two. Verse 19. Just like we read in Romans a moment ago. For the law made nothing perfect. But the bringing in of a better, there's that word again. But the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. Now, what in the world is he talking about? This whole system now of the grace of God, which goes out to the whole human race. The gospel that Christ died for our sins. And that he was buried and he rose again from the dead the third day. That isn't limited to any one group of people. And that is the better system that has now been introduced not just to Israel but to the whole world under that high priesthood of Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God. And oh, listen. You and I have got the greatest message the world has ever known. That no one is left out. Anyone who can simply recognize their need and believe it can enter into life eternal and enjoy all the blessings of this priest Melchizedek. Because he is now the priest of the Most High God interceding for us. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding.